All right, let's jump into it. So we're uh, continuing our journey through the book of Daniel. And you know, before we get into this particular chapter, which might be the chapter of the book in terms of like for us, uh, but let me, let's step back here. When we launched this whole study into this particular book, I mentioned that Daniel is the most controversial book in the entire Bible. It has come under more criticism and been torn apart by the world more so than any other book. It's more controversial than Revelation. It's more controversial than Genesis. It's more controversial than any of the other 65 books. And if you weren't here for that, I kind of explain why. But I'm going, to go and, I'm going to hammer home a point here. Why Daniel? What is it about Daniel? Well, if you just take like a 30,000 foot view of this, and I think there's two real specific reasons why, but just if you take a, a, a sky view of it, if there was a book that came out in the 20th century that uh, made all these predictions, uh, you know, that predicted JFK, that predicted the Challenger explosion, that predicted 9-11, that predicted coronavirus, that would come under a lot of scrutiny and, and criticism itself, right? Just for, for something that predicts a lot of events. And Daniel has predicted human history for thousands of years. So that in itself puts it into a category of like coming under a lot of heat. But it has been attacked, I think, for two big reasons that we probably should recognize. One, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus uses the book of Daniel as <clears throat> the foundation for understanding the end times. You know, when four disciples come to him and they, uh, they're just private, they're, they're with him on, on the Mount of Olives, and they ask him to explain what's going to happen in the end times and how will we know if we're going through the end times he spends two chapters hammering away at this, and he uses the book of Daniel as the key to understanding all in time prophecy. And he references Daniel multiple times. So um, if you can undermine the book of Daniel, which basically one of the criticisms is it wasn't written by Daniel. It was actually written by a fake Daniel 300 years later who wrote all this stuff, you know, and basically filled in the gaps. In essence, if you wrote a book right now that explained all these, you know, events like JFK and 9-11 and on and on, if you wrote that now and put it that it was written in 1945, right, that, that would kind of be what they're saying in the book of Daniel. So it's come under a lot of scrutiny because it makes all these predictions. But if you can undermine the book, if you can devalue it and show that it's wrong, then that means Jesus got it wrong. And if Jesus got it wrong, the whole Bible falls apart, everything, and your faith falls apart. Why? Because you are betting your eternity on a man who claimed to be the son of God, who claimed to be sinless. If you can prove him wrong, it, we're done. And what does Paul talk about? Our faith is worthless and we're trapped in our sins. So that's what we're betting on. Uh, and so one of the attacks, Daniel kind of leans back to Jesus' emphasis on the book. There's also a second reason, though. <clears throat> I, I believe that this book, this particular book, I mean, really the whole Bible, but the book of Daniel is the book for the end times church. It's going to be the manual for understanding what's going to happen <clears throat> when the church goes through the end times. So those two things, so you have to look at it like this. It is a, it's not just a worldly battle against this book. It's a, it's a supernatural attack. And if the enemy can undermine Daniel, then he undermines the church, church's ability to uh, understand what God's plan is for them. So two things to consider. So we're going to get into maybe talk about the, the, this whole book being kind of controversial. Chapter eight is probably the most controversial of them but maybe the one of the most important ones to us. So it's called the Ram and the Goat, I called it. Let's kind of get this outline here. There's 12 chapters, but they're not in chronological order. Just kind of refresh your, remember the first six are the historical life of this prophet Daniel, the prophet that God loved. And it starts with him as a teenager and goes all the way to uh, the end of his, his life there. But it's, uh, it's split up because the first six are his life. But the next six are these visions that happen along the way. <clears throat> so we're, these are not in uh, chronological order. And uh, last session, we looked about the four beasts, which connects us back to chapter two. Let me see if I can find it. So chapter two and chapter seven are kind of uh, connected. These, these whole, actually, 
two, seven, and eight are. And it shows this kind of pattern of these world empires that are going to happen from Daniel's time to the end of time, but then how Jesus comes at the end. So it's kind of pointing to Jesus' second coming. These are what these, if you want to drill down what these prophecies are, it's about the world and Christ's second coming. And uh, just to give you a picture, call this the times of the Gentiles. So back in chapter two, <clears throat> uh, King Nebuchadnezzar gets a vision that God gives him of this metal man statue that represents all the empires that will happen from Daniel's time to the end times. Head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron. And then this, it's really not a fifth empire. It's this fourth empire remade somehow in the end. And it's the iron mix with clay. And we, you discover, because it's, uh, it's through there, it's explained that the head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire, chest and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, bronze represent the Greek Empire, iron, the Roman Empire. But then at the end, there's this, I'm just going to call it Rome 2.0. It's a kind of a revived Roman Empire of some sort of the iron mix of clay. We get to chapter seven, the last chapter, and you get these same world empires from a different viewpoint. Daniel chapter two is, is the world's view of these empires, but Daniel chapter seven gives you a view of these empires the way God sees them. And he sees them as four incredible beasts. Babylon was a winged lion, Persian a bear on one side, uh, the Greek empire, the, a leopard. And then Rome was this terrible beast that later becomes into these 10 heads. And this gives us a little bit more insight into what maybe is coming. So that's how that all ties together there. So let's, if, if that's still too confusing, hopefully this will uh, kind of help you out. Let me see if I can move this over. So you got Daniel 2, Daniel chapter 7. So here's the pattern here. Metal man statue representing these empires. <clears throat> the rock, which we learn is Jesus Christ, comes at the end and destroys all these empires and sets up his own kingdom. That's the pattern. So it looks like these successive world empires, Jesus Christ comes, sets up his kingdom. Now that's the pattern. We see that in Daniel chapter two, we see it in a little different way, but it's the same pattern in Daniel chapter seven. Instead of the uh, metal man statue, we get these four beasts, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and this uh, terrible beast. And then we get God giving Christ the you know authority to come and establish his kingdom and sets up his dominion. So it's the same pattern. I mean, yeah, you can get into the nuts and bolts and all this stuff, and people have explained this, but that is the concept. There's these world empires that Daniel's given from Babylon all the way to the one that we're going to experience, or our, <laughs> our descendants will. At some point in time, there's going to be a, a revived empire, but then Christ is going to return and set up his kingdom. That's the pattern. Hope that helps you out and doesn't confuse you. Okay, so we're going to be looking at uh, this down the road, but chapter eight is going to focus on this transition from <clears throat> the Persian to the Greek Empire, and then how this ties into the end. So it gives you a little bit more depth. Each each vision he gets gives you a little bit uh, clearer picture of what's going to happen. So here's kind of the outline. What we're going to do in chapter eight, if you've already read it, you've kind of experienced this, but um, <clears throat> let's look at it like this. The first eight verses of it is going to be the rise of Alexander the Great and how this ties in to it. But then in verses 9 through 14, these are the five hardest verses. It's going to talk about this little horn. In chapter 7, the little horn was the Antichrist, right? This revived Roman Empire, I'm going to call it. And out of the revived Roman Empire, there's one little horn that comes up that established himself over that. Now, what we're going to look at is, is the little horn of chapter eight <clears throat> the same as the little horn of chapter seven? Is this the Antichrist? But then after you, after you get that, those 14 verses, 15 through 26, Gabriel, the angel, will explain the vision. So that's the cool thing. We don't have to interpret it because Gabriel's going to do, do it for us. So that's kind of the breakdown of it. Alexander, the great part, and Gabriel explaining the vision is the easy one. The tough one is those five verses, nine through 14. So we'll try to uh, I'm going to try to present it, not in a way that points you one direction. I want to kind of present the different viewpoints of it because there's a lot of different options on it. Let's, uh, let's start 
chapter eight with the last verse of, of the chapter. I want to get to the end. This is how it ends. Daniel's going to get this vision, but this is how the whole chapter ends. And I want to point something out. It says, I, Daniel, was worn out. He's just received this vision that we're going to see. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. And that's the end of the chapter. And I want to, I want to start with that because would you agree that, that Daniel is a very wise man? This is the prophet that God loved. He was given so much insight. He was known for his wisdom. He rose to prominence in two world empires. This guy's wise. And he is saying, this vision is beyond my understanding, right? And Gabriel explained it to him. So I point that out because if you find yourself like, wow, man, this Bible prophecy stuff, this is, <laughs> this is hard. This is over my head. Don't worry about it because it was over Daniel's head. And that should give you a little bit of peace about this. But what you're going to see with Daniel, you're going to see this in the next chapter, is Daniel is going to do a Bible study. He's going to pray. He's going to do a Bible study. He's going to study scripture. And he's going to gain understanding. Uh, and you will too. And this is my second go around. We did this uh, study, Daniel, back in 2019. And, you know, my first time through, I learned a lot. I'm going back through it again a second time. And um, I've probably doubled my understanding. And if I do it again, that'll probably happen a third time. So, you know, we don't have to understand all of it right now, but this is what God has commanded us to do is to, you know, it is the, it is the privilege of God to conceal things and the privilege of Kings to seek them out. That's what we're doing. All right, start right here. Um, <clears throat> in the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, uh, saw a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. And remember, we, he got one vision in chapter seven. And just from a time standpoint, Belshazzar's reign, this is, uh, remember Daniel gets kidnapped as a 14 year old and spends 70 years under the Babylonian empire. He will outlive that empire to the next world empire, the Persian empire, and he'll rise to promise there too. But this is, uh, this is probably about 12 years before the end of this Babylonian empire. So that puts him, I don't know, in his late 60s, okay? But to, he's, not a, he's not a teenager anymore. He's been there for, you know, 50-some years. But this happens about 12 years. As a matter of fact, this, um, it's this chapter here, chapter 8, that if you think about the, the chapter 5 we did, the writing on the wall, they had the big party. This guy, King Belshazzar, will have this huge party, and what he'll do is he'll make a bad, big mistake. He's got alcohol and prostitutes and uh it's 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 a it's it's a big it's a big bash but they're having this party and he sends them to go get the um <clears throat> the the cups and the utensils that they had stolen or at least a nebuchadnezzar had stolen from the temple back when they demolished jerusalem these are god's utensils that came out of his temple right and he decides this party to go get them and drink out of them and it is a slap in the face of God, you know, and that was his mistake. Well, in that, in this big bash, uh, this just perverse party that's going on, there's, there's a hand that appears out of nowhere and writes a mysterious phrase on the wall called the writing on the wall. Daniel gets called in. He gets summoned in to go interpret that. And Daniel, one of the reasons that Daniel knew what the writing was about was because of this chapter. Because he had had a, he'll have about 12 years to kind of marinate on this, study on this, and you're gonna see, you're gonna see him studying next chapter. He's gonna study his Bibles, which is pretty cool. But one of the reasons he understood that was because of chapter eight. This chapter he's been studying for 12 years, so he had a good insight. <clears throat> in my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Uli Canal. He's giving you a setting here. Now, this is interesting. He's in the citadel of Susa, I'll show you a picture of that in a second, in the province of Elam, this is the ancient name for what we would call Iran, right? So he's in Iran, and Susa is actually a city there today by the Uli Canal. All right, so that's a city. Now, this is where people, this, people find, um, uh, I don't know, I guess there's a little bit of controversy in this. There are some that believe that he wasn't actually in Susa. So he's in Babylon, right? So think 
in modern terminology, he's in Iraq, right south of uh, Baghdad. That's where he's at. Uh, Iran is the next country over. So they believe one, one viewpoint is that he's just, he's, he didn't actually go there, that he was given a vision there, right? What's interesting is a lot of the ancient scholars, I mean, the, the, when you go way back, you know, the early church, the early church fathers, they actually believe that he was transported physically there, that he actually was transported to a different destination. Kind of like we've seen this happen where Paul into the wilderness, Ezekiel was transported uh, back to Jerusalem, John in Revelation, you know, was it just a vision or was he transported forward into time? You know, so, so what, you know, that's the debate. More modern scholars believe that this is just a vision. Seems like as you go back, I find it interesting, but they felt like he was physically transported. But regardless, he, he sees this setting. It says, I looked up and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal. And the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. Now, this verse three, <clears throat> you get Gabriel here and, you know, as we get towards the end of the chapter, he's going to interpret this. This is going to represent the, um, the Persian Empire, and he's going to explain that. And if you think about Persia so far, in the metal man statue, it was the chest and arms of silver. It was two arms of silver, the Medo-Persia Empire. And then when we got to the, um, what was it, the, 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 in, in the beast uh, vision, it was a bear that leaned up on one side. One side was stronger than the other. And here you're getting the same imagery, but it's a ram with two horns, but one horn is longer. And it's all, it's all going to mean Gabriel, the angel is going to explain this, but this Persian empire, Medo-Persia, but Persia came to grow up stronger than the other. So that's what this verse three is all about. Elam is, is Iran. Okay, this fortress at Susa, this is the palace of the Persian empire. And set up on the hill. They've actually, there's a rebuilt version of this here that they have in Susa. Susa is still a surviving city. And you read a lot about this. This is found throughout scripture, this, this famous place in, uh, in Aram. It, uh, it's about 230 miles away from where Daniel is. He's in Babylon, which is about 55 miles south of Baghdad today, which they're actually rebuilding. And um, he is 230 miles, think, think north of the Persian Gulf is where this vision takes place at. The province of Elam, which is uh, found in the famous Table of Nations, Genesis 10, uh, built by Darius, which we read about in uh, chapter five. This is the home of Esther. When you get to the book of Esther, this is where she will live. This is the king uh, and the palace, the citadel of, uh, of Susa. There's also the city of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah will be here. So it's found throughout scripture. And uh, they actually excavated and found the famous Code of Hammurabi back uh, about 100 years ago. Okay, so that's the vision. Let's kind of jump into this. This, this Persian, we'll talk about the, the ram here. The ram was a symbol of Persia, the Persian Empire. Some interesting things about this. The ram was considered the guardian spirit of the, of the Persian Empire. And uh, in the Zodiac, Aries is the ram, and Persia was connected to this astrological sign. It's a whole other discussion you get into, but I found that interesting. That, yeah, keep in mind, when, when Daniel's getting this vision, there's not a Persian empire, right? It's, it's, not, it's not established. It's, he's looking into the future. But, uh, but the imagery the Holy Spirit has given is the ram. Fascinating. The Persian king rode at the head of the army, wore, wore the head of the ram. He wore a head of a ram. That's how much as they marched out into the military. So what did it look like? What did a ram helmet look like? What looked like that? It's amazing, right? It looked, it looked just like that. Okay, uh, my point is, I find it fascinating that the Holy Spirit uh, writes and engineers the scripture outside of our time domain. And yet here, this Persian empire was very much ram-centered. And years and years and years before they even exist, he's given this, um, this vision of the ram. Anyway, chapter four, I mean, verse four, I watched the ram as it charged, uh, charged towards the west, the north, and the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue it from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. Now, notice it doesn't charge towards all three directions, okay? It charges towards those particular three directions, and this is what will happen down the road. 
you had this is basically the the Medo Persian Empire. This is the extent of their. You can see kind of see the uh, extent of where it was, and there's Persia. But when it started its campaign to conquer the world, it went in three directions, not east. It went uh, north up into uh, uh, Libya. It went um, west into Babylon and then south into Egypt. And that's the three directions. So that's exactly what would happen. As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. Now, again, Gabriel's going to explain this. It's, a, it's imagery, right? It's like a parable. Here's a ram. Here's a, here's a goat. And that verse four is the rise of the Persian Empire. Now he's going to see the rise of the, the Greek Empire. A goat with a prominent horn between its eyes, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. This goat runs so fast that it doesn't even look like it's touching the ground. And where this was the rise of the Persian Empire, they would be conquered by the Greek Empire. So you go back to like this chapter two, chapter seven. I keep referencing this, this image because it kind of gives you a little insight into these world empires. And not that you have to know your world history, but it helps us to see the timeline for what's going to happen in our future. So it gives us some insight into looking back so that we can kind of look forward. Uh, but you can kind of see, you know, Persia was the chest and arms of silver, a bear on one side. And, the, um, and he, he's not getting, by the way, he doesn't get anything. Daniel, this vision doesn't include the Babylon empire that he's in. Why? Because he's at the end of it. But uh, we get the ram, chest and arms of silver, two parts of the empire, one of them stronger than the other, bear on one side ram with one horn longer than the other and now you get this the, the greek empire belly and thighs of bronze it was represented in the his last vision as a leopard a leopard is extremely fast right with four wings which we'll touch on in a second and here it's represented by a goat that runs so fast it doesn't look like it's touching the ground it came it came toward the two-horned ram i had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it in great rage what does that mean well, when you look into this, you know, the Persian Empire conquered the world. And for 200 years, they oppressed the people. And this little country of Greece, really, it's actually like Turkey and Macedonia. They were, they oppressed them hard. They, they were hard on them. And so by the time Alexander the Great comes, and this is what this is about. He, uh, they, it's just like, think about this. It's the bully on the block that beats up all the little kids. And the little kids are scared of him. But eventually the little kid grows, 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 and he pushes back against the bully. And when he gets the bully down, he beats the daylights out of him. That's what happens with this. Uh, the Greek, the, the nation there, Macedonia, uh, when they went after Persia, when they finally got the edge on them, it was, it was harsh. So this is actually the last king of Persia, this guy Xerxes. He was the last ruler of the Persian Empire. He's the king that married Esther. When you read the book of Esther, you read about him. Uh, he makes this attack on Europe, Western Europe, and against Greece, and he took an army of 300,000 men that he will go after Alexander the Great, 300,000. Alexander took about a tenth of that, he was, and, he, and he defeated him, 35,000 people in this famous battle. I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. He will shatter the, the, the Medo-Persian Empire. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. And that's what will happen. Now, this is, by the way, this Daniel seen his vision. This is going to be now 200 years into the future, his future. The goat became very great. But at the heights of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Okay, that's interesting. So this is this, this transition of Persia to the Greek Empire. Those of you that hate history, you're like bored to death with it. It's, it, it's going to make sense in a second. Hang on, hang on. Uh, but the goat became very great. This is Alexander the Great in the Greek Empire. But at the height of his power, the large horn was broken off and in its place, four horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. Take a quick look at this guy. Visionary conqueror, military genius. He was a son of Philip of Macedonia. That's where he grew up. It's, it's not actually like Greece, Greece that, that we think about, but Macedonia. At the age of 20, he took over from his father, and he made an assault on the Persian Empire. They were going to break free of them, and he conquered the entire world within six years. Took out the Persian Empire and took out the rest 
of uh, the known world at the time, within six years, it moved so fast, small, but quick. And notice the imagery that's been given here. It's uh, the belly and thighs of bronze, it's a whole different discussion, but it was a leopard that moved really fast, a goat that moved very fast, conquered the whole world within six years. By age 26, he was the world's ruler. By the age of 30, he expanded the whole Greek empire from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to, the, to India. Big empire. And he would die at the age of 32. So he conquered the world fast and died young. And um, his legacy is he created a new world order, a world currency, and a one world language. He's the one that would uh, translate the whole Bible into well, his predecessors uh, or his descendants. His generals down the road, they would all they would translate the the, uh, the whole Bible into Greek. So the world spoke Greek by the time Jesus came, and that's a pivotal point. Okay, this actually they've done this computer generation of like his statue. This is funny. That's what they believe he looked like. There you go. So the Persian Empire, this empire, two hundred years in the making, was destroyed in three quick, devastating battles, and uh, that's exactly what happened. Okay, uh, so it talks about, let me go back here. Uh, at the height of its power, Alexander the Great, the large horn was broken off. He died at the age of 32. And in his place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. What does that mean? Again, Gabriel explained this, but after Alexander the Great died, actually the, the legend has it on his deathbed, they asked him, to whom does the empire go to? And he said, give it to the strong. And what they did was, they took his empire and gave it to his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. There's a lot of debate and study about this, but that's basically the, the, the four generals. And, you know, it'll talk about how the empire will never be as strong as it was under Alexander the Great, and it won't because these guys will all kind of be jockeying for position, and, and a lot of them were classmates of, uh, of Alexander. So there you go. Um, so that is, so we've got the, the ram and the goat now, but this, let's go to this next part right here. Because so far, that's, that's, that's all going to be explained by Gabriel. But now we get into these next five verses are the most controversial of it. Out of, out of them came another horn, which started small, but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land, which is Israel. Okay, let's talk about this little horn. Now, remember, there is a coming world leader, and he has many, many titles, 33 in the Old Testament. There's only one title in the whole Bible that uses the term antichrist, but he has, you know, son of perdition, man of sin. One of his titles is the little horn of Daniel 7. So people all genuinely believe that the little horn of chapter 7 was the antichrist. Here's the question. Is this little horn the same one? Here's the problem. You got the little horn from Daniel 7 came from the fourth empire. It comes from the remnants of this revived Roman empire. And if you hadn't been with us a long way, all these empires, Babylon, Greece, um, Persia, they all were conquered by another empire. Rome, Western Rome, wasn't conquered by another empire. They broke into pieces and it broke into Spain and Germany and France and England and so forth. Right. So they somehow come back together, whether that's a European super state or whatever. But the point is, the little horn from Daniel 7 comes from that fourth empire. The problem is, the little horn from Daniel 8 comes from the third empire, the ram and the goat, and it comes out of the goat. So the question is, it's either not the same guy or two views of the same guy. So that's what we're going to look at. A little bit more on this little horn. It says, it grew until it reached the host of heavens. And, uh, and some of the starry hosts uh, cat, and cast some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. Well, that sounds, I mean, what does that mean? It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. Who's the commander of the army of the Lord? Who is the commander of the Lord's army? All throughout the Old Testament, that is Jesus Christ himself. It, talking about this little horn, took away the daily sacrifices from the Lord. What are the daily sacrifices? That's the sacrifices that Israel does in the temple. You know, this, uh, this is an important thing. As, you know, as uh, 21st century Christians, we can't really understand this, but 
we ask forgiveness for our sins. If you're a believer, right? Uh, and Jesus Christ is faithful to, uh, to forgive that, okay? What about the Jews? They don't have Christ. What do they do? Sacrifices, right? Blood sacrifices. The temple, right? So Jews who are very sensitive about sin, they take this very seriously. The problem with, with, with the Jews right now is they have no mechanism to atone for their sins, and they desperately want that, which is why they desperately want to rebuild the temple and begin daily sacrifices. Now, this verse 11, whoever this little horn is, this coming world leader, sets us up, up to be as great as Jesus Christ. Think about that. And it will take away the daily sacrifices from the Lord. Well, to take away the daily sacrifices, <clears throat> that means the sacrifices had to be gone. Is there a temple right now? Nope. Are they killing cows and bulls in the temple? No, they're not. But in this time frame right here, whenever this is, there's daily sacrifices going on. And God's sanctuary, the temple will be thrown down. So Daniel's getting a vision of a certain time, and we'll debate whether it's historic or future. Now, let's go on, verse 12. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were giving over to it to the Antichrist, the, the, the coming world leader. And it, this little horn, prospered in everything it did and truth was thrown to the ground. What is truth? Scripture's the truth, right? So this Antichrist, well, let me back up here. Whoever this little horn is, is gonna prosper. People make jokes about the prosperity gospel. Yes, because th this leader is, God's going to allow him to prosper. He's going to prosper. And when he prospers, God's people are persecuted. They suffer. The more he prospers, the more we suffer. So let's get that in mind. Okay, let me give you a couple, just some points here. Um, Antiochus, in case you're not up on your Greek history, which I wasn't, but uh, this is one of the beliefs of who this might be talking about. And I'm going to give you a couple of viewpoints in a second. But remember, we had uh, the Babylonian Empire. Persia takes them over. We just saw where Alexander the Great, the goat, conquers them. This is part of the Greek Empire. <clears throat> Alexander the Great dies, and four of his generals take over. Here's how this ties in to all this, and it ultimately ties into the New Testament. One of this, this is in this lineage of, uh, remember, broke up, and let's just call it the Syrian dynasty, which is part of this whole Greek Empire. Antiochus IV, this is, the, he's talked about in the Book of Maccabees. The Book of Maccabees is not in our Bible but it's in the Catholic Bible. It's in the Apocrypha. It's the extra biblical text. And it talks about this guy right here. What did he do? He outlawed the Bible. At that time, <clears throat> you had the Torah and the Tanakh. The Tanakh is the, the Old Testament that was translated into Greek. And Jews at that time followed the Torah, which is the five books of Moses. When I say the Bible, it's the Bible at that time. Jesus uh, preached from the Bible. But it wasn't the New Testament, it was the Old Testament. So that's, I'm just using that so we kind of get some context. But he outlaws it. He outlaws the Torah. Slaughtered pigs inside the temple. Why would he do that? Because it would anger the Jews, because that was forbidden. And he would go into, I mean, we don't have laws against eating, you know, ham or bacon, right? We don't. But can you imagine if a government leader or the president had pigs slaughtered inside your church, right? Like, even though that's not against our law, that would, wouldn't go over very well. He burned copies of the scripture, burned the Torah, killed Jewish moms for circumcision. Part of the Jewish law was you would circumcise your baby boy on, on the eighth day. He would kill them if they did that. This guy hated the Jews. I want you to think of an ancient Hitler who despised everything the Jews stood for and thought them less than human. This guy is the same thing. He put up a statue of Zeus inside the Holy of Holies. What's, what's the Holy of Holies? It is the temple of God. Inside is the holy place. <clears throat> but then inside of that is the Holy of Holies. In the temple, what was inside the Holy of Holies? The Ark of the Covenant. And what was between the two cherubim? The Spirit of God. This is the holy place a place that people weren't allowed to go into. Once a year, the high priest was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies one time a year 
and they would tie a rope around his ankle when they did, just in case something went wrong. This guy goes in there. Of course, the, you know, by this time, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is gone and God's spirit's gone. But he goes into their holy place and puts up a statue of Zeus or Jupiter, whoever it was, you know, just to defile it. And uh, he had over 32,000 Jews killed. This guy hated Jews. That's my point. <clears throat> now, this, this guy becomes, in a lot of people's mind, a prototype of the Antichrist because this coming world leader is going to do these very same things. He's going to outlaw scripture. He's going to destroy whatever, whatever happens. And um, he will persecute the Jews. So this guy is kind of a precursor to it. And um, by the way, if you want to get into this, what happened? You, you, this, I said it's the book of Maccabees, the Maccabean revolt. What happened was they, they were killed. They were, uh, you know, their, their Bible was burned. But the thing that pushed them over the edge was, and they actually revolted, was when he went into the Holy of Holies and defiled the temple and put up a statue of Zeus. And uh, Judas Maccabee led the Maccabean revolt and actually defeated them and they gained their independence. But this is called the abomination of desolation. And this is a reference point that Jesus will use. He'll talk about, this is what, uh, 164 BC. So, you know, roughly, what, 90 years later, Jesus is going to be talking about the end times and he's going to point and say, when you see the abomination of desolation, Okay, well, pause. Well, Jesus talked about when you see it, okay, but yet it happened in the past. So that's where the confusion is. Let's talk about this right here. Um, because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. And this is talking about a certain time. Verse 13 to 14. Then I heard a holy one speaking. So Daniel is hearing people having a conversation. And another holy one said to him, how long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. That abomination of desolation, that's what this other holy angelic being is asking. How long is it going to take for they're going to eliminate the daily sacrifices, they're going to have some type of abomination of desolation, and the sanctuary is going to be destroyed? When, how long? Verse 14, he said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. Okay, so you've got a timeline. You've got a time prophecy. 2,300 evenings and mornings. What in the world does that mean? And the re rebellion that caused desolation is the same event that Daniel will talk about, the abomination of desolation, and what Jesus will refer to as the abomination of desolation. So this is an event that is a trigger that we know um, involves the Antichrist, possibly. Let's talk about this 2300. I'm going to give you three different viewpoints and just to kind of get your mind on this and you can do your own study and come up with it. Interpretation number one is that a day year prophecy that the 2300 days represents 2300 years. This is where this actual verse right here is where we get the Seventh day Adventists that came from this verse because they marked out 2300 years from this time. And when you do the math, they believe that this great second advent awakening, Jesus Christ is going to return 2,300 years from this vision. Okay? This is in the, the sixth century. William Miller, Ella G. White, interpreted the sanctuary as the earth, which would be cleansed at Jesus' second coming. And the date of the second coming was established to be 1843. So they were expecting... Jesus to return in 1843. That would be 2,300 years from this time of day. Of course, 1843 came. Jesus didn't come. They went back and they looked at the, at the calendar of when Daniel received this vision, which they believed was about 12 years before the fall of Babylon. So they're kind of putting it together and they realized, okay, they were a year off. Jesus is actually going to come in 1844. Didn't happen. 1845, you get it. On and on. Okay. Uh, so that's, but that's where they get that. Here's a second view that this, this little horn of Daniel chapter 8 that's going to cause all this stuff to happen, he is just kind of a, I'm going to call it a shadow view. He's a shadow of what is to come. He's a precursor of what's of the real Antichrist. If the 2,300 days are taken as being literal 2,400 days, which is not guaranteed because the Bible uses this reference of an evening and morning was the first day back in Genesis. 
Is that actual a 24 hour period or is it something else? But if it is a literal 24 hour day, this would be between six and seven years, okay? Which is about the time that this Antiochus persecuted the Jews that we were reading about. He basically outlawed the scripture and, and you know, killed moms and circumcised their baby and slaughtered pigs. And he did all this within a six year period. And so the six years from Antiochus first attack on Jerusalem from 170 to the restoring of the temple in 164 is about 2300 days. So maybe that's what it's pointing to. Okay. The Jewish priest Judas Maccabeus, the hammer, drove out the Syrian Greek army, then cleansed and rededicated the temple. And so some see that as the 2300 days. And uh, by the way, they still celebrate this event in the Feast of Lights, which is called Hanukkah, Hanukkah, which is actually scriptural. John 10, 22 talks about this festival. Okay, here's a third view of it, though. So that one would be like the, the Little Horn of Chapter 8 happening back then in the Greek Empire, Antiochus, okay? A third view sees it more as coming in the future. This evening and morning, <clears throat> which is actually Hebrew, Ere and Boker, um, if, you, if you do the math, it would, it would equate to 1,150 days, Okay. Uh, 110 days short of 1260 days or three and a half years. This three and a half year period, this goes back to what we know is coming in the future. This 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years, that's going to be the word that Jesus called the, the great tribulation. So it, they believe that it is pointing towards that in this future view. They also see this little horn, not as Antiochus, but as the future world leader that we kind of refer to as the Antichrist. So they see this 2,300 days as that time. And um, I, 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 you know, what's the right answer? Well, I see it as a sense of double identity. And I give you an example. We see this throughout scripture. Ezekiel is writing about the king of Tyre. And he writes about the king of Tyre. But in this passage, it flows from the king of Tyre into the prince behind the, the throne. Okay, a prince behind the throne. Hmm. Isaiah does the same thing. He writes about the king of Babylon, an earthly man, just like the king of Tyre was an earthly man. But then in it, he flows into the prince behind him. And in these, you get actually the, the, the career of Satan and his rise and fall from power in this. But wait a minute. I thought we were talking about a king, an actual human being. It starts that way, but it flows into something else. So, for example, Ezekiel is writing about the king of Tyre, a man, a guy. But in it, he starts to flow and says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Well, that's not the king of Tyre. Your clothing as adorned with every precious stone, I ordained and anointed as the mighty angelic guardian. So you see, get this sense in uh, chapter 28 that we were talking about a guy, but then it flows into something else. And I think you get a sense of this with this Antiochus, this little horn of Daniel chapter eight might very well be Antiochus, a man, but it flows into this Antichrist. All right. Gabriel explains the vision. Should have just went straight to here rather than me explaining it, right? Chapter, uh, verse 15 says, while Daniel was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man. Whoever this is looks like a man. And I heard a man's voice from the Uli calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. And it's got to say I've never heard anybody talk about this, which probably means I'm wrong. But when I read this, I'm thinking, whoever this man is, he looks like a man. He's telling the archangel Gabriel to give Daniel the, the meaning of the vision, right? Who is Gabriel? Gabriel's one of three super angels. We know Michael, we know Gabriel, we know Lucifer. Each of them have their own job description. Gabriel seems to be as the press agent the announcement guy for Jesus Christ himself. He shows up here in the Old Testament. He will show up in the New Testament. He'll come to Mary and say, hey, Mary, you're expecting and you're going to deliver uh, the birth of the Messiah, right? But he's always showing up to announce Jesus is coming. That's kind of what he does. And so here's this man, quote man, that Daniel sees. And I always wonder, is this the Lord himself? telling Gabriel to give him the meaning of the vision? I don't know. That's probably way off base. As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, not Jesus, son of man, but that's a reference, Old Testament. He said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. 
When does it concern? The time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath. Not here on earth, but a time of wrath. Because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. Three times in two verses, Gabriel saying, this is for the time of the end. It's in the end times. The angels tried to get us to understand and get you to understand that this concerns the times of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Okay, no question there. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece. And we know this is, it, it's the first king of Greece, so we know that's Alexander the Great. And uh, the horn between his eyes is the first king. So the goat is the Greek empire. The horn is Alexander the Great, the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. So that's what we're talking about. His generals took over Alexander the Great's empire, but they were never as strong as he was. In the latter part of their reign, whose reign? Those generals and uh, that took over the Greek empire. So we're talking about out of the Greek empire in the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. This is this little horn. When does it come? At the latter part of the Greek empire. See? But the little horn in chapter seven comes out of the revived Roman empire, we think. So there is the confusion. He will become very strong, but not by his own power and will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. Who's that? God's people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior when they feel secure. He will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. He will cause deceit to prosper. People are going to be deceived. Jesus talks about this also. He says in the last days, people will be given over to a great delusion. They will believe the lie. This guy, this little horn, will consider himself superior. And when they feel secure, God's people feel secure. He will destroy many and take his stand against who? The prince of princes. Who is that? He will take his stand against Jesus Christ. This is not an, uh, uh, just a man, right? It's not like Napoleon or Adolf Hitler or something like that. This guy's going to be supernaturally empowered by Satan himself, and he will take his stand against Jesus. Yet he will be destroyed not by human power. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision for it concerns the distant future. Seal it up. Keep this sealed. And we're going to see at the end of this whole book where Gabriel seals up the book of Daniel until the end times, meaning the book's going to be unsealed as we enter the end times. And here's that closing verse. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. So uh, so that that is it. So. A couple of things, this abomination of desolation, we kind of went through it pretty quick, but there was an abomination of desolation that happened under that Antiochus, if you remember that. He went in, burnt, basically, this is a paraphrase, it. he burned the Bible, slaughtered pigs in the temple, and put up a pagan god in the Holy of Holies, right? And that started this huge uh, event where the Jews got their freedom from the Greek empire. Jesus talks about, and that's known as the abomination of desolation. But Jesus, 100 years later, talks about when you see the abomination of desolation. So we know one is coming again. So is the one that happened back then, what's going to happen again? Think about this, Bible boot camp in 1945, right after World War II. If we're doing a Bible study, we're talking about Israel in the land. We're talking about the temple being rebuilt. There is no Israel in 1945. There's no nation. They uh, were chased out of there back in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. But then in 1948, Israel becomes a nation again. And the Jews come back into the land. So whatever this end time happens, what we're reading about has to happen after 1948. In 2017, President Trump moves the capital back to Jerusalem. So we've got a nation. We've got the city back. In 2019, President Trump gives the Golan Heights back to Israel. These things, I'm pointing out, these things are starting to come into place. The nation of Israel is back in place. The city of Jerusalem is back in place. Is the temple next? That's the only thing that's remaining.
This whole chapter, if I could sum it up, talks about this coming world leader that is going to somehow allow Israel to have a temple and perform daily sacrifices, which they desperately want. Can you imagine a world where cows and bulls are killed on a daily basis to atone for their sins? Man, the world, can, uh, can you imagine PETA? So we've got a lot of stuff going on here. So this, this, is, a, this is a tough chapter, probably the toughest of the whole book. And, uh, you know, I encourage you to go back through it, look through it. I'll, I'll try to present you some different options of it, you know, um, and there's a lot of great commentators that uh, I follow and I really respect, and they all have different opinions of it. What we do know is that Jesus uses this as a reference point to say, when you see the abomination of desolation, for us in particular, as Americans, we kind of get locked into our just our New Testament church world. We don't realize that the whole story is about Israel. The church has its place, but the church age, there's a beginning part of the church age, and there's an end time. The rest of it is centered on Israel. And the temple at some point in time, we know because, you know, the apostles and Jesus himself reference the temple being in existence, and there, there will be daily sacrifices, and it will be taken away. So uh, that's it. Go back and read through it. Check out your notes. Next chapter, probably the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. Think about that. From Genesis to Revelation, the Gospels included, many consider chapter 9 of Daniel has the, 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 the greatest verse of the Bible. So we're going to look at this, uh, the 70 weeks. And if there's one chapter out of the whole book of Daniel that you want to kind of get a framework for how to understand prophecy, Daniel 9 gives you a cliff notes version of how to, how to categorize all events what's happening here in america geopolitically and uh, we'll cover that next week in daniel chapter 9.